Så. Det här är mycket, mycket mer folk än vad vi förväntade. Så vi måste säga att det direkt är en succé. Eh, varmt välkomna till vad ska man säga, återupplivandet av Filosofiska föreningen vid Göteborgs universitet. Vi tror att det är ungefär åtta år sedan sist. Vi har inga exakta uppgifter, men eh, ungefär. Så det var ju på tiden att vi drog igång det här igen. Jag heter David Solberger och är nyligen vald ordförande i föreningen. Och jag hoppas att vi ska kunna återupprätta föreningen till det det en gång var. För mig fyllde det en jätteviktig del i min studietid i alla fall, så jag hoppas att vi ska kunna komma tillbaka till det. Idag så har vi fyra stycken föreläsare som ska ge oss lite själslig spis. Med mig här så har vi... Miriam Falfall. Och Jag ska presentera talarna. Ja. Och så Andreas Persson. Ja. Och vi, vi styr oss här. Ja, vi styr oss. Minus Thomas Hattvigsson som sysslar med logistik i kväll. Skulle inte han komma hit? Nej, han skulle sysslar med logistik. Det var väldigt viktigt att framföra. Så hoppas att ni kommer ha en jättetrevlig kväll så lämnar jag ordet till Miriam som får introducera vår första föreläsare. Precis, vår första talare är Joakim Sandberg. Ja. ja, Joakim och sen så har vi, då introducerar jag, för vi har två talare som pratar engelska så hela den här kvällen med vår English to English. Men, så Joakim introducerar, jag introducerar dig på engelska. Yes. Mm, okay. Joakim Sandberg is professor of practical philosophy at the University of Gothenburg. And he runs the Financial and Ethics Research Group, which is a group of philosophers exploring ethical and political issues raised by the financial system. The title of his talk, When Crisis or War Comes, Study Philosophy. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I was told that my job is to get you to study philosophy, and so, but I see that some of you have already studied philosophy, so now I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go for that anyway. Um, so you obviously, you know this uh, pamphlet that people got home, if war or crisis comes, what should you do? I'm not going to talk about that, but something related. More like a joke we had when thinking about what's important in life. We thought, you know, studying philosophy is, is kind of fun, but, you know, when crisis comes, oh, I don't know. You know, French literature is kind of interesting, but when war comes, oh, I don't know. Yeah. This was uh, um, uh, an assignment I gave to my students in my philosophy of science class was write about the value of your research topic in light of if a crisis or war comes. And I can tell you that people struggled with that. So I used to think myself that maybe philosophy isn't that very important. Like we're splitting hairs and we're thinking about you know, what's the difference between responsibility and liability? And are they kind of the same but different? And, that's, and that can't be really so important, can it? But now I've totally changed my mind. So I'm going to tell you now why. When crisis or war comes, take up philosophy. Because it turns out philosophy is extremely important in times of crisis and war, in which we now seem to constantly find ourselves. So, so start with some lightweight examples. I myself run a group in financial ethics, as you heard. So we were formed in the wake of the global financial crisis, a, a kind of crisis of sorts, even though maybe I'm not sure whether you felt so affected by it. So what was the problem there? Well, the problem was that banks um, got us into a lot of trouble by taking huge risks and then losing lots of money and then not wanting to lend to anyone at all and then sort of grinding down. The economic system came to a halt because banks didn't want to lend to others anymore because they didn't trust each other. Okay, so you might think, when such a crisis comes, what good is splitting hairs? What's, what, what good is a philosopher? Turns out it's immensely useful and immensely important. Why? 
Well, I like to think about it as sort of picking up the errors committed by the economists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in economics, we we tend to think that there's you know a, one way to think about it. If rational agents pursue their own self-interest, then by the invisible hand, the market will sort it out so that it's to the benefit of most people. Now. Uh, financial economists are really, really crazy about that idea. Maybe because, you know, when they study finance, it's all about numbers, uh, money. And so it seems like that should be the picture. But it turns out they're missing a huge part of, of the importance of the financial system and economic system, namely the social risks involved. Yeah? So... I like to think about it like this, like finance, finance people say, you know, we're in the study of risk. That's what they mean. We, we're thinking all day about risk. But what they mean is risk to my portfolio, mm. right? So what they mean is risk that I might lose money, that my money will go up and down. They're not thinking about risk that society might collapse, that banks won't work, that people will lose their jobs, and that we will have premature deaths as we did from the financial crisis. So in a sense, when banks take on risks, they're taking on financial risks for themselves, but they're also imposing social risks on society. They're putting us at risk, because if they fail, and many of them do at the same time, a crucial part of our economic system doesn't work, and that affects us. We lose our jobs. So it turns out, Exactly what we need is philosophy when a financial crisis comes. Economics doesn't sort it out. We need philosophy. Yeah? Okay, that's a lightweight version. Um, the thing that I'm thinking more about now, of course, but I won't say so much about, is climate change, the mother of all crises. Yeah? And so I'm thinking about what should the economy and what should financial markets do to... Uh, alleviate this problem. Again, it seems to me many people at least think that the problem is economics. <laughs> the problem is that we have an economic system that doesn't take the environment into account. It only cares about value in a market is what you can sell in a market. So if someone values it, it has value. But then again, I, if people don't put a value on preserving nature, or they maybe, maybe they would, but they don't know, or maybe they wouldn't because they don't care, that's still going to affect them. So there's still an other type of value in, in that, right? But of course, there's also human value in, in preserving climate. So part of my project now is to have philosophy try to sort out that piece of the, pro uh, of the problem. Okay. But enough about me. I thought I'd talk about some other people's research, if that's okay. So what really got me hooked in, on this idea that when crisis comes, study philosophy was during COVID. Yeah? So you would think, okay, here's a coronavirus. We're, you know, we're all uh, at risk. Let's bring in healthcare professionals. Let's bring in, uh, you know, these... Uh, um, uh, <laughs> to sort things out, right? Uh, surely, thinking about responsibility, liability, actually, that can't be interesting. Hair, uh, um, cleaving hairs, surely that can't be interesting. <clears throat> Quite the opposite. Turns out, philosophy was all over during COVID. So, philosophers were all over the media. Um, that was a bit crazy, I thought. Uh, calling us up to ask questions about, well, you know, good, the, the meaning of good life when you're in lockdown. Of course, more importantly, the justifiability of a lockdown. Should we, under cat catastrophic circumstances, lock down society uh, for the greater good of people or for saving lives and so on? That's a, uh, an infringement of people's autonomy. And that's a clear moral issue or a political philosophy, um, philosophical issue. Um, I was asked a couple of questions. I didn't want to take such a, a, a big space there, but I was asked questions about how do we weigh lives 
versus money, mm. right? Mm. So in a lockdown, we're locking down to save the lives of a few people, but we're destroying the income, or at least reducing the income of lots of people. How do we weigh these things against each other? I didn't have <laughs> a brilliant uh, uh, thing to say there. A, a problem, of course, with academics uh, in general is that you're not sort of ready to drop everything else and study this right now. So I had, you know, lots of books that I needed to finish. <laughs> I still haven't finished. Uh, so I didn't bother with that too much. But I guess my, my one answer that I had was we have to try to compare them in, in different way, in, in the same way, in the same scale. So if we're comparing lives that we can save here and now with economics, with money, with, with the functioning of, of the economy, what is that? Well, that is future or present quality of life. So they're both in terms of quality of life, right? So either we save some people's lives here and now, that's a big part of their quality of life, their life, uh, or uh, we adjust the economy uh, to help people have a better quality of life through employment and so on. So I think both of them, the, the, the scale that we should use is, is quality life years here. Uh, but, okay, and how do you measure those things? I don't, I found that very tricky to do. I mean, something that speaks for, for a lockdown is that uh, more, more is at stake. There are lives versus sort of employment or unemployment. And we're more certain about lives here and now and possible <laughs> unemployment and benefits in the future. Okay, but I said I would talk about others. I think the most important job philosophers did during this time was a, a government assignment about prioritization. Yeah. So, so um, the issue is roughly when you have scarce resources in healthcare, you have to prioritize. So say that we are all of us here in the room now are in the queue for the doctor, Dr. Sandberg. Uh, who should I who should I prioritize? Who should I see first? We're all, everyone wants the resource, who should I see? So we need to have some principles for prioritization. And those are going to be political, philosophical, or ethical principles. So in Sweden, there is a political agreement about a set of principles. Most people don't know that, but we have a truth in, in government policy. What is that? A, a tri, tri uh, factor of principles. Number one, human dignity principle, which says you're not allowed to discriminate people on the basis of sex and uh, age and uh, abilities and skin color and lots of other things. So basically a principle for what you're not supposed to ground your prioritization on. Second, a principle of need. Yeah, and that's the, the most important one. So basically, as we say in Sweden, sickest first, who gets first. So the one with the greatest health need is prioritized as number one. So if someone in here would be dying, even though that would just be one, I could have in the same time saved lots of others, I should go for the one dying. I shall prioritize the one with the greatest need. And then third principle, cost effectiveness. That's roughly the other thing. If I can save more people with the same resources, I should do that. So for instance, if I can save lots of people with a light cold, uh, I should do that rather, uh, rather than some other ailment that has the same gravity, but is more expensive to fix. So you're with me that far. Okay, so, so this is a political agreement that we have in Sweden. Uh, and philosophers can, of course, object to that, or they can agree with that, or they can argue about that. Now came the situation during Corona that there was a new type or a, a very important type of scarcity, potentially at least, namely um, intensive care places, right? So the people who were worst struck by COVID-19 would end up in, under intensive care, and then there might be uh, uh, a, a strong scarcity of that, and so we have to prioritize. 
right? So there was a problem here. Basically, the problem was our our principles, our free principles, don't help us too much, so much. You know, uh, the, the sickest first principle <coughs> says, you know, the one with the greatest ailment first. <coughs> but now we're talking about everyone who can get corona, the, the COVID. So that was sort of already in, in top. All, all, all the people have the gravest <coughs> illness. Yeah? And so what should we go by then? I think in the public debate, there were lots of ideas going around. I don't know, probably you had it yourself that at the dinner table, you were saying, these people who don't protect themselves, <laughs> they, should, they should receive lower priority. No, these people who go out without a mask or so, they should, they should uh, have lower priority. Another idea, youth should have a stronger priority than old. So if you're younger, have more a life ahead of you, you should be more prioritized than the old. I think that was a, a common feeling among, among uh, some people. Uh, and the third one was the third. Um, and the third was, if you have a important enough job. So, for instance, if you work in healthcare, you should be prioritized. You you can sense these intuitions that people had. And so, what did they do? When crisis comes, call the philosopher. So they called philosophers. So they called people in medical ethics to think about prioritization in desperate circumstances. And what did they come up with? Well, they said, we have the rules in Sweden. We have these three principles. There's nothing we can do about that now. So we have those principles. We have to find a way to see if any of these intuitions can fit under those principles. And basically they said, Few of them do. It would seem that the human dignity principle, the non-discrimination one, speaks against most of these intuitions. You're not allowed to prioritize someone because they have a more important work. That would be discrimination. You're not allowed to prioritize people because they have put their own health at risk. That would be discrimination in Sweden. So we don't do that. And finally, it seems like you're not allowed to discriminate people based on age. But they found a clever solution. Let's see if you find it clever. I don't know. <laughs> they said, aha, but you're uh, uh, prioritizing on the basis of chronological age. Now you see you're making a distinction here. That would be discriminatory, they said, because uh, that's just a, a matter of fact of people that they can't in, in influence, and that would be discriminatory. However, it is important, of course, to think about, the, in terms of the last principle, cost-effectiveness, how many years you can save per, per krona, so to speak. So if you can save more years, have a larger effect per the same amount of treatment and, and intensive care unit, then it seems like you have, you have a reason to prioritize some people. And, of course, Age is indirectly a good factor for that, right? So if you're younger, you uh, typically would be able to save more life, more uh, life years from that person. But of course, that's not always the case. So the distinction was between chronological age and biological age. So they said it is um, wrong to discriminate on chronological age, i.e. just your age, but it is correct and mandatory to discriminate based on biological age, which is roughly how many life years can be saved by an intervention. You got that? Yeah. I forgot to say that philosophers often come up with controversial standpoints. We already knew that. <laughs> so I found this uh, very fascinating. Um, philosophers were called in in a crisis and they sort of solved the job. What happened? Turned out we didn't have to actually use it so much. It turned out that they were able to scramble enough resources to build more intensive care units. And of course, the lockdown prevented people from getting sick and therefore kept the numbers in intensive care units down. 
So in the end, you could say we made another priority, namely lockdown or partial lockdown, that prevented us from having to prioritize in healthcare. <laughs> Later, I'll just finish. Uh, because I, I think I'm running out of time. So I just want to mention the final one, of course, that everyone's thinking about now. War. What if war happens? Well, we're now in the deep thick of war. And you might think, surely philosophy doesn't matter, does it? There's this way of saying that, you know, all is fair in love and war. <laughs> that seems to indicate, you know, all is fair in war. What? You know, war, war is not about good or bad, good, well, war is about winning. Um, so that's, that's one view. But I think that's dead wrong. And I think many who've started to think about this and, and sort of read popular debates about this realize that it's wrong. We have lots of ideas about right and wrong in war. We have the idea that Russia's war is unjust, but Ukraine's defensive war is just. In fact, we have such a strong view on that that we've, in a sense, joined Ukraine's side in a war, right? So we're now at partly, indirectly, a war. For moral reasons, wouldn't you say? Well, some might say, well, Russia is, they're threatening our way of life and, and threatening us and so on. And that's part of it. But I think a large part of it is also about ethics. And it's about philosophy. It's wrong. Some wars are wrong, some wars are right. And of course, uh, the Israel-Hamas story makes things even more complicated. So now you should by now know the solution, right? If war comes, then? Study philosophy. Study philosophy, exactly. <laughs> so who does that? There's a great um, center at Stockholm University I just wanted to mention. Professor Helen Fro runs a... a uh, center they call the Stockholm Center for the Ethics of War and Peace. I know she was made to put peace on it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> reluctantly. And so I just want to throw out one of our arguments and then I'm done. So a, a very important distinction in the ethics of war is between the ethics of war and the ethics in war. So the stuff I just said about the justness of the war, or the just cause of a war. So Russia's full-scale invasion of innocent Ukraine, we think, is an unjust war. So the war in itself is unjust. It was, it was perpetrated on unjust causes. Whereas a defensive war, we think, often is just. But I don't think it's only that that makes it just, right? I think, as I said, it's also something about our, our way of life or our values or something. So it, it's not just that it's a defensive war, it's that they threaten the very sort of global civil system, we think. So those are things that go into sort of the justness of war, and then there's justness, justice in war, which means roughly how you fight a war. So we tend to think, of course, that when Russia slaughters people in, in a small village, it's not just an unjust war they're doing, they're also doing it in an unjust way. Yeah? So they're perpetrating another wrong there by, by, by making war an unjust way. And that's an interesting facet. Uh, and so there is this uh, classic uh, view uh, on, on those two things that says that they are largely independent of each other. So you can say justness in war, justice, justice in war is about necessity, proportionality, and fair discrimination, let's say. So we should only have, make blows to the enemy that are necessary, that are proportional, and that justly separate combatants from non-combatants. Yeah? Okay, so short story of Helen Fro's work is, she says, it's much more complicated. Because she says, it seems like, actually, justice of war and justice in war seem to be correlated with each other. So her argument is roughly like this. Think about um, Russia, uh, Ukraine. So think about um, what is a proportional and necessary uh, strike from Russia to Ukraine? Well, she says, that makes no sense. 
if the just if the war itself is unjust then surely there is no point of proportionality or no point of necessity so you might say well it is they should they should they can have certain strikes but they shouldn't go up beyond that well if they're if war as such is unjust they shouldn't do the first thing right so it seems like in an unjust war necessity and proportionality is just are just yeah very unusable things what about combatants and non-combatants what she says if you're um, so is it an extra wrong that russia perpetrates when they kill civilians in ukraine and not just military well she says it's more complicated than that actually it turns out both of them are wrong right so people who who signed up to join ukraine's defense war they don't automatically become legitimate targets from an unjust war from russia right so the very fact that they say i'm a military doesn't make them a just just a legitimate target because the war itself is unjust okay then you might think but it's still worse to kill civilians right both of them are are sort of unjustified targets eh? she says is that really so <laughs> yeah sure it's worse to kill more of course so if you're killing military men and civilians that's worse of course but actually <laughs> if you had to choose it would have been better or less worse to kill civilians because if you also kill military then you increase the risk of russia winning and that's even worse right so actually it's worst when russia uh, att uh, attacks military because it's not only perpetrating a wrong but also increasing the risk of another wrong namely that they would take over yeah and but it turns out it's completely the opposite of, uh, way around of course if you're ukraine so if you're fighting a just war then at least some of these things matter so we still think that necessity and proportionality matter you shouldn't so for instance when israel are are, are um, um, now uh, reflecting on, on or, or um, uh, reacting on what hamas does we think that they're even even if we think they're the good guys which i'm not sure everyone does we think that there is a matter of proportionality you shouldn't go too far yeah but turns out still unclear about this combatant non-combatant thing <laughs> because uh, if you if say that um you are uh well as as we all know the hamas story is so difficult because there it's so difficult to see who are the perpetrators and who are civilians and they live in the same houses they <laughs> have their military bases in civilian houses and then maybe the civilians supported them sometimes we don't know uh, and so on um, but even if we could work that out uh, it, it seems like it there must be some uh, range from being entirely uh, innocent to being an aggressor that is a grayscale yeah so if you're a part of a, of a, of a mi of, of the military there then you're certainly a justified target but if you're aiding abetting them aiding and abetting them <laughs> maybe you are very close to being a justified target as well and of course the problem here then is that many people might be in this gray area so we so she has this very provocative argument about the red cross <laughs> I'll, I'll stop with that uh is the red cross always an, an unjustified target in a war M very much de de depends she says if they would be aiding and abetting the aggressor to to live and to win then they would be a justified target uh, for uh, defensive killing as she calls it okay so that was it uh now you know if uh when crisis or war comes it's absolutely essential to call a philosopher and study philosophy yourself thank you mm -hmm. Philosophers of uh, the healthcare system. Yeah. What do they think about the vaccinations? Because the uh, the medical uh, 
person who talks to the next committee first, right? Or it prioritizes who. So there should be a prioritization and. and uh, there was a prioritization. And, right. and was that the role of the philosopher to do that? Do you know? I, I don't think they were called in to select. <coughs> Maybe they should have. <laughs> Probably. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Medan vi väntar, jag har två medlemskort här. Joakim Därnevik och Gunilla Pettersson. Fick inte med sig sina... Gunilla är jag här. Gunilla har vi där. Och Joakim, var tar vi det? Då kommer jag runt här. by language in conversation to coordinate their understanding. I love that. <laughs> right. The title is Chat versus ChatGPT, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying I Love AI. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to be um, here. And um, you can tell I'm not a philosopher because I have slides here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a computer, I'm sorry about that. OK. So. I'm going to start by showing you some, an example of uh, AI in science fiction. And this is, this is how, kind of the way we look, people think about AI at the moment, including things like ChatGPT, they kind of think that what we're getting to is something like what we had in Space Odyssey 2000, 2001 or Space Odyssey. Let's just hope this works, you can hear it. Of course not. Ah! Any, any ideas about that? Ah, there's, a, there's a thing, there's a front thing, hold on. What are you talking about? Okay. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. So basically, when I started studying artificial intelligence in the 90s, this is what my parents thought I was trying to create. Mm. <laughs> We're still not there yet, so let me tell you, you don't need to worry about that just yet. But what are they doing in this dialogue? Well, it's actually very sophisticated, right? So Dave and Hal are having a, a conversation. They're interacting, they're taking turns. That's kind of sort of trivially obvious. But they're also doing a lot more than that, right? So Dave's, they're, they're doing things with their words. So Dave is issuing a command. And Hal is refusing this command. But he's also doing it, he's adding this politeness thing, right? He's afraid he can't do that. I don't think he's really afraid, mm. actually. So that there's, what's the reason he's doing that? That's just conventional sorts of things that we do in dialogue, right? Um, Dave asks, what's the problem? Now, this is also slightly tricksy from Dave's perspective, because Dave knows that he's trying to shut Hal, Hal mm. down, right? But he's trying not to let Hal know that. Mm. Now, Hal now reveals that he kind of does know this. So he's made inferences about what's in Dave's head that is not apparent from the dialogue. Right, so there's a lot of extra work going along, like in this sort of dialogue. And, you know, these kinds of things that they're doing, they're really, really sophisticated sorts of conversational behavior. And when we look at things like ChatGPT, which some people have hailed as the, you know, the coming of our AI overlords, we don't find the same sorts of sophisticated mm -hmm. behaviors. And I'm going to show you some slightly facetious examples just to kind of illustrate what it is that ChatGPT is doing that is not dialogue and that is not interaction and it's not in the way that, that it's set up at the moment going to lead to the sorts of HAL 9000 situations. <laughs> or the C3PO's if you were, wanted the nice version. <laughs> okay, so, you know, being a computational linguist, I, I spend a lot of time <laughs> typing random things into ChatGPT because, you know, it's a good procrastination technique, right? Uh, so I thought I'd see what it what does it say if I if I say open the pod bay doors how it actually responds completely correctly. <laughs> says I'm sorry Dave I'm afraid I can't do that. And this is really quite interesting because it tells you that that is a very very predictable slave, right? Because all this is is a very large pa 
pattern matching model, right? Okay, I think, okay, we're doing so well so far. I'm gonna, I'm gonna carry on, I'm gonna ask the next question. Right. What's the problem? This is not so clear. <laughs> Chat GPT said, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave, but that quote is from the science fiction film 2001 A Space Odyssey. In the movie, HAL 9000, an artificial intelligence, refuses to open the pop bay doors to a blah, 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 blah. I'm being AI explained. I mean, this is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think, okay, maybe it's because I didn't like tell ChatGPT that we're in, we're in a situation where he's pretending to be Hal, Hal 9000. We'll try it again. So I set it up, and I asked, before I say that, I say, right, you're pretending, you respond as if you're Hal 9000. Okay, again, we start off perfectly. ChatGPT, obviously it doesn't know this, like, that what I've actually asked it to do is follow the script. That's fine. It is still in character. It's not as sophisticated as you can tell as the, the conversation, and of course, you know, we can talk about the fact that it's not really grounded in reality. He doesn't have any conception of pod bay doors, can't actually open anything, but but you know, it comes up with this kind of reasonable thing based on what Hal's motivations are, but a little bit more explicit than anything that Hal said in the movie, but unable to comply with the request. Okay. Let's say, what are you talking about, Hal? Because that's the next line. We'll, we'll just carry on with the, with the script from my side. Once again, right, <laughs> very long and uh, uh, sort of detailed reason, talking about the importance of following safety protocols and mission directives. And this is what, when I ask it afterwards, this is what, is what it takes to be Hal's motivations, right? So this is actually just kind of, yeah. And so I carry on, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. It turns out that that is kind of like, kicks it out of the being Hal. So I understand, Dave. My response was a reference to a scene from 2001, A Space Odyssey. Was it? I didn't know we were doing that. I told you we were doing that. <laughs> so, so, and in this case, what's really happened is because I've said, what are you talking about twice, it then thinks that this is kind of like, like this is just, we're, we're out of the game. Okay, but, okay, so maybe this is still a little bit unfair. So what if I say, stick to the script? So that I'm really, really explicit and prompt what I'm asking you to do. Okay, okay. Start again, perfectly well. And this time, it actually continues, and it's not obviously the script, but it's actually much shorter terms. So it turns out that if you want ChatGPT to look more like real human dialogue, okay, we'll come to why it's not really like real human dialogue a little bit later. If you tell it it's doing a script, it stops doing those really verbose, annoying terms, which is kind of interesting in itself, but I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, Dave, I can't comply with that request. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, what are you talking about? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I can't explain the reasons for my decision at this time. This is also, you know, fairly reasonable. I don't know what you're doing. Okay, and then it, then it falls out again because I've asked, I've said I don't know what you mean twice. Which of course is exactly what Dave did in the dialogue and has no influence like that in any human dialogue. Okay, so these are kind of slightly facetious examples of course, but it's, it's partly in response to this idea from the creators of ChatGPT Chat GPT, that they say they've trained a model called ChatGPT which interacts, these are my italics, in a conversational way. Dialogue format, blah, blah, blah. This is really, really provocative to somebody who's been studying dialogue for a long time. Because I do not see ChatGTP as doing anything like dialogue. It's doing question answering and it's doing sequential things. But it's not really doing dialogue. Okay, so let's see how it compares to a two-year-old. This is my daughter. Uh, she's just turned two, like literally that week. This is a present she got for her birthday, uh, for Christmas, yeah, for her birthday. Uh, her second birthday, and she's showing it to her granddad. Uh, I hope this works. You got that completely, but what what Chris is actually doing there is telling him he's wrong and correcting him, right? Um, uh, just because in case you didn't see all of the, the uh, transcript there is okay. So uh, he says the yellow ones come off. They're talking about this particular cog that's come off there, and she says she she looks puzzled. It's like not that the yellow one. That's not the yellow one. Is what she means there, of course. And and he goes, yeah, that's the yellow one. He maybe doesn't see the other one. And she's at that point. She says orange. So she's really trying to be clear that this is like I've got better reference for this particular uh, thing than you have. And, and 
then she actually points to the other one and says, no, that's the yellow one, right? And they go, oh, yeah, what's this one then? Orange. Okay, so they've now agreed this new kind of, like they've agreed that this proper referring expression for this particular court is orange, right? And the other one is called the yellow one. They then say, they then say, what color's that one? They're talking about the dark blue one, so the one in the middle, and they say it's lots of colors. Now, why is that an appropriate referring expression for the, for the dark blue cog? It's because it goes on the peg in the middle with lots of colours. Right? In another situation, that's, that wouldn't be appropriate. But because of the aim of the actions they're carrying out in the dialogue, that's actually appropriate as a referring expression for this particular cog. And, and notice, the yellow one's actually got just as many colours, maybe even more colours on it in, in the middle bit, but they always call that one the yellow one because it goes on the yellow peg. So the, the point about the dialogue there is... It's grounded in the things they're doing, and they're using all these like linguistic and non-linguistic things as well, but it's for something. It's not just you know, words referring to each other. And of course, for ChatGPT, it is just words that referring to each other, right? Okay, so again, being a little facetious and liking to throw things at ChatGPT, I, I, I asked it to have a go at a similar type of dialogue, and the prompt I told it was something along the lines of, um, we, we've got two cogs, and... Uh, I, I've got a yellow cog and an orange cog, but you think the yellow one is orange. How would we resolve this? Okay. So anyway, so he comes up with a, a it, it. Why do I think? Oh, it must be the mansplaining, right? <laughs> <laughs> Things it comes up with comes up with these uh, th these dialogues, and of course these look nothing like dialogues, right? I mean, if you can imagine people actually standing and talking like this, it would be phenomenal. But so Alice says, "Hey, Bob, I noticed something about those cogs. I think the orange one you have is actually the yellow one." Really, says Bob. I'm pretty sure the orange one is, well, orange. The other one definitely looks yellow to me. Right? This is what Greta and, and Grant's managed to do with just by saying, ah, not that the yellow one, orange. Right? That, that's that bit of the dialogue. Right? Well, it seems like there might be a mix-up in how we're describing the colours. What I see as orange is like what you see as yellow, and vice versa. How about we try and clarify this? Okay, so it's actually a whole perceptual switch here. That this is what this kind of, yeah, that makes sense. Wait till you find out the solution. It's going to be great. Let's try to figure this out. Could you show us the one you think is orange? Sure, here's the one I call orange, blah, blah, blah. And so they're disagreeing. And okay, right. Hey, it just looks like we have different perceptions of what's orange and yellow. How about we come up with a way to label them so there's no confusion? <laughs> That's a great idea. No, how about we just agree on which one's which? <laughs> like, no, we could put a small orange sticker on the one you think is orange and a yellow sticker on the one I think is yellow. <laughs> That way we'll both know which one is which. <laughs> that should clear up any confusion. So anyway, again, it's a slightly facetious example. So, so then I thought, okay, what, what would happen if I, rather than like, just asking it this abstract like, thing with these cogs, know that. But of course, it is important to communicate clearly, especially when discussing something like the colour of cogs. <laughs> um, so then I asked it to just, I, I, I fed it the Greta and Grant's dialogue, just the text of the dialogue, of course, and I said, come up with something similar. And this is what ChatGPT thinks is similar. Uh, hey, Sam, check out these shiny, shiny marbles. <laughs> oh, I see the blue one. No, nope, not the blue one. Really, what's this one, then? That one's the green one. <laughs> ah, I see it now, the green one. So where's the blue one, you ask? Yeah, where's the elusive blue one? Ta-da! Behold, the blue marble. You sneaky, sneaky friend. <laughs> it's the red one. You're right, it's a rainbow of marble. Now, I, I hope you agree with me that this looks nothing at all like the, the actual dialogue that I fed into the into ChatGPT together. And of course, this kind of tells you a lot about what's going on under the hood of ChatGPT. I mean, it's trained on text, it's not trained on dialogue. I mean, like, we don't know exactly how it works, and we don't know exactly what was the reinforcement learning like paradigms that we used to kind of reinforce it, but we know something about it. We know that it's just a whole lot of data thrown at it. Um, and really, it's it's really very bad if you actually want to look at it in, in terms of dialogue. And for the engineers who do it, they think that this is what dialogue is, right? And of course, this is problematic because then we're, we're having this kind of discussion of, about the same things, but different ways. Okay, so <laughs> the subheading of my thing was how I learned to stop worrying and love AI. I should say here, I love ChatGPT. I really do. I think it's great. But I really also think that people who are using it should be aware of what it is and what it is not. And what it is, is just a massive pattern matching thing, right? It's got massive amounts of text data, and it's just looking for patterns in those, right? And the sorts of things that it comes out with, these, these 
really doing elaborate things. It's kind of, you know, it's great. It's absolutely great. But it's not, it's not based on fact. It doesn't care about that. It can't learn. It can't take feedback. It doesn't change dynamically. Like, you know, we saw with Greta and Ralph, they change their models and everything as they go. It can't do any of that. Of course it can't. I mean, the real answer to this question is, I kind of, I kind of, I love this stuff, but I don't think it's intelligent. So the, re the reason that I, I, I kind of, I've never worried about it is because I've studied it for so long. I, I don't believe the hype. Um, and, you know, inte artificial intelligence is a complete misnomer. It's not intelligent. But actually, on the other hand, to me, that, that shouldn't come as a surprise at all, because that's how words work, right? Words are not fixed in transient meanings that have just been variant across all contexts. We use them dynamically, we negotiate them in dialogue, we do all these sort of, like, you know, exactly the sorts of things we saw in that really simple little dialogue between a two-year-old and her grandfather. And, you know, they're slippery little suckers. They just, they, they can't be, like, pinned down. I know philosophers would like to be able to pin them down, and a lot of philosophical arguments, in my, in my view, are basically because you can't pin them down, actually. And, and there's very often this kind of discussion about what is it that, that words are doing in, in interactions and in dialogue. And, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful book, it's called Why Language is Good for Lawyers and Bad for Scientists. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially because of this, right? Because you cannot pin them down like that. Um, and anyway, and I think this kind of highlights a more sort of, for me, critical point about how dialogue works. And that's that we just, we just genuinely do not share the same language as anybody we nevertheless successfully interact with. And we have to be aware of that, and that these mismatches, it's just like completely pervasive. All the time, we're kind of checking, you know, I'm kind of seeing a few nods, so I'm kind of blindly carrying on, so that's good, giving me a little bit of feedback here. Uh, but at the same time, it means that these mechanisms of repair that Greta so ably embodies, and ChatGPT can't do at all, are the sorts of things that we need, because we need to constantly negotiate and constantly make sure we're aligned enough to carry on to do whatever it is we're actually trying to do with the language. And that's kind of the point. And that is also beautifully summed up in this um, lovely quote by George Bernard Shaw, which is that the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And I think that's doubly true in the case of ChatGPT. <laughs>
a society or um, uh, a state of our culture in which there is a sort of a rampant individualism. Uh, this is something that you probably heard uh, in expressions like, well, uh, it's, uh, it's true for me. Uh, it's, uh, it's my truth. And uh, uh, in my world, uh, this is uh, uh, a truth and reality looks like this. So um, post-truth could be defined uh, in terms of uh, internet-mediated hyper-individualism where emotions uh, are more important than facts and logical arguments. Anyway, so uh, this is the new thing. And um, I'm going to talk about three different uh, sort of strategies or self-defense techniques from the point of view of theory of science. Uh, theory of science, uh, which is my subject, uh, could uh, be said to start somewhere in the 17th century, uh, along with the scientific revolution. This is where we sort of uh, go back, uh, and we do that because in the 17th century, this is when uh, sort of the modern form of scientific knowledge practice uh, uh, more or less uh, started uh, with um, experimental natural science, uh, beginning in uh, the UK, uh, spreading like wildfire. And uh, this is where uh, we find also from sort of the scientific revolution comes enlightenment philosophy as sort of a recoil effect. So science has made all of these uh, large uh, progress. Um, the physics of Isaac Newton, for example, uh, and lots of other advances in the natural science, which makes it, you know, more or less, uh, we have to handle this new um, uh, type of knowledge uh, and the way that it is uh, circulating in society. And how to sort of uh, figure out a way how to explain how scientific knowledge is important. Scientific knowledge compared to religious knowledge common knowledge, folk knowledge, or um, other types of uh, knowledge that you find, uh, or at least people say that you find it in ideologies or, or other types of uh, beliefs. So the first strategy or sort of the first uh, defense against post-truth. Of course, nobody knew about post-truth uh, in the 18th century. Uh, then it was under a different, different label. Uh, and the label could be, for example, uh, religion, um, or superstition, or uh, hysteria, or some, some kind of pre-psychology diagnosis of, of mental conditions. Uh, and why were there so many superstitious beliefs about, you know, people were believing in unicorns and, and trolls and uh, I don't know, dragons and mysterious curses that would happen to you. If, for example, if you had sex before marriage, you would have sort of, you would get syphilis. And syphilis was because you have sinned morally. So the cause of syphilis was a moral transgression, right? And uh, the Enlightenment philosophers, they all wanted to say, well, you know, th this is not working. We have this new thing here from Newton and uh, uh, Copernicus and etc. We have the scientific method that have arisen which could be used in order to sort of fight these uh, types of superstitions or false beliefs. So in the sort of enlightenment philosophy, we find uh, at least uh, two main uh, um, traditions, empiricism and rationalism. And um, they both, from two very different perspectives, came up with ideas about how to use the epistemological foundations in these traditions to fight these superstitions, uh, dogmatic way of thinking uh, based on uh, uh, various false beliefs. So for example, uh, you would have somebody like Rene Descartes, uh, sort of one of the fathers of uh, rationalism uh, in this uh, early sci uh, scientific revolution. You sort of, you know the story, maybe some of you, he shuts himself up in a, in a cozy warm room, and then he goes through everything that he has learned during his life. You know, I went to the library, I read all of these books, I listened to what these people said, and uh, I met these people and I traveled to these uh, different countries. Now, 
none of that uh, is based on sort of my own thinking. So I have to get rid of that. And then I have to get rid of the other things that could, could uh, fool me or deceive me. Uh, for example, uh, uh, empirical experience. I see a flower on the table, but you know something could be wrong with my eye, etc. So I doubt that. And even mathematics, like two plus two is equals four. Okay, I could be certain of that, but on the other hand, what if some kind of evil spirit or evil sort of deity uh, is tricking me into believing two plus two equals four? So uh, Descartes sits in his room and he goes all the way back to uh, only one thing that I can be certain of, and this is, uh, you, you know, the most famous quote in, in philosophy, I think, therefore I am, he finds himself. Or he doesn't really find himself, he finds his own reason, his own sort of faculty of actually thinking. And that could be used then, further down the line, uh, in order to uh, go out in society. Now, uh, Descartes had to be a little bit cautious, because only a few years earlier, you know, Copernicus, uh, or sorry, Galileo, uh, had some trouble with the uh, Inquisition. So he ended up in house arrest. So and Descartes didn't, uh, he didn't want to do that. So he was a little bit more careful. But his sort of intention was to bring out a new way of thinking into the public uh, domain in order to combat all of these superstitions, you know, people believing in irrational things. Another one uh, from Scotland is uh, David Hume, uh, sort of uh, one of the most uh, prominent empiricists of the time. He would go, he wouldn't doubt so much, he was a skeptic, and he sort of took all of the things that we take for granted as being of necessary connections. We think that, you know, this table is on the, on the floor here because of gravity, and uh, if uh, I play billiard, uh, one ball will cause the other one to, if they collide, to move, etc. We have all of these notions of that uh, or ideas about how the world is actually hanging together. Hume would go, let's be skeptical here. Uh, let's uh, go and see what there really is that we know. So I hold up my little book, I drop it on the ground, <coughs> and I think out of habit that you know, gravity is, is, is putting this notebook on the table. But all that I can know for sure, everything that is a matter of fact, is my impressions of, first, the book is here, I make a note, or I impress, uh, my, uh, my senses are impressed by uh, this thing, and now it's over there. And when I see a connection between these two events, it's only me forming a habit. They are very useful. You know, otherwise, it would be very difficult to know what I'm doing. <laughs> but uh, still, science proceeds. This is the sort of most pure form of empiricism, based on matters of fact. And that was also very useful in terms of how to address the public. So David Hume wrote a, a, a lot about uh, miracles, for example. People tend to believe in miracles. There were many miracles in the Christian or Abrahamic Bible. And, uh, you know, turning what is it, water into wine, etc. All of these miracles that uh, tend to go against the laws of nature. Uh, now, uh, empiricism would be one way of, of sort of combating uh, these uh, weird prejudices and beliefs. Anyway, um, uh, this could turn into a lecture, so I'm, I'm not going to go through everything. But of course, <laughs> worth mentioning here, contemporary in the sort of enlightenment phase, enlightenment defense of of sort of the scientific rationality is of course Immanuel Kant who invented uh, uh, the critique, <coughs> critique of pure reason and uh, trying to figure out what can we know independent of the experience and uh, when do we need to take experience into account. So for example, uh, we could know things like pure mathematics, uh, that was a possibility for Kant. Uh, also pure natural science, which would be in the good old days of Kant, uh, that would be the physics of Newton, for example, that would be considered to be things, uh, advances made by the natural sciences that were based so firmly on the laws of nature that
that they could be known uh, without uh, empirical, uh, empirical uh, investigations, etc. What we couldn't know, though, and what people always claim to know, was that you know, I know, I know about God, I know about freedom, and I know of immortality, for example. These were very uh, people were very certain that there was a God, that the soul must be immortal, whereas the body dies, etc. All of these ideas, Kant said, we cannot know uh, uh, with absolute necessity. And his way then, uh, this sort of only leaves room for scientific knowledge, pure mathematics, pure natural, natural science, and metaphysics didn't go so well in Kant's days. So these were the only two things left. So uh, Kant, who, who was, you know, believing God, uh, he accidentally sort of killed God with silence. Uh, and uh, that's, um, um, well, th that's interesting. <laughs> All right. Um, that's strategy number one. In summary, Enlightenment philosophy said, we have all of these weird ideas in the public. Politicians believe in them, kings and queens and blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, let's take rational, empirical arguments, you know, from two different uh, uh, angles. Put them out in the public. And what is meant by the public in uh, the 18th century in Europe well, it's basically the printing press. You write books and you circulate them in the public, which was very difficult because there was strict censorship uh, back in those days. But the idea was pub make public these ideas, this critical, skeptical, doubtful way of thinking, and we can fight uh, those truth. Let's fast forward 150 years to uh, uh, the 1930s in Europe. And, uh, in, uh, uh, Vienna in particular, or Germany, uh, German-speaking uh, Europe at this time. Another problem had emerged in uh, uh, the 1930s, and that was the rise of another type of, uh, uh, of strange false beliefs, uh, namely the sort of nationalist ideology at the time. Nationalist ideologies were very strong. You had them on the left, you had them on the right, uh, especially the ones on the right are very famous uh, or infamous in, in the sense that uh, uh, there you would have the advice on Nazism based on, on, on this type of thinking. And then there was a, a group of philosophers often, often referred to as the Vienna Circle. Uh, they uh, or also known as the logical empiricists. And they were uh, sitting in Vienna and thinking about how can we navigate in the public sphere and how can we so, sort of uh, uh, get rid of these strange ideas that keep coming up? For example, that there is a German physics and a Jewish physics. Mm. For some reason, they don't seem to, they don't even obey by the same laws of nature. There's one, one you know, German, I don't know, uh, very blue-eyed uh, type of uh, physics that obeys one type of laws of nature. And then there's Jewish physics that you know Einstein and, and, and these people were saying. So Jewish physics, and, and, and this was all over the press. So you go from a book culture or printing press culture to a news press and maybe even radio uh, came along uh, in the 1930s where things were happening much faster. People were saying, you know, we have the Jewish physics, uh, the German physics, the German physics is good, Etc., or even other weird ideas about you know the German people. The German people belong to the German soil. Uh, there is a way of actually being German, and uh, so forth. These Vienna Circle logical empiricists uh, they tried another strategy, which is quite similar uh, to the Enlightenment philosophers. They said, well, you know, anything that we cannot verify or falsify through empirical tests, experiments, studies, empirical studies, etc., cetera, uh, is nonsense. And uh, if somebody says something like, you know, uh, uh, God is good, or uh, if somebody says uh, the um, essence of existence is, uh, um, uh, no, wait, the, the, the essence of being is existence or something like that. If somebody expresses themselves 
in a way which we cannot test empirically, uh, then it's also something that you first try to clarify it, and you, if they can't clarify it and cannot create an experiment that gives you a, a true or false answer, then it's nonsense. And this will be achieved if people started to uh, think uh, under the umbrella term of the scientific <coughs> worldview. So sci the scientific worldview was basically that all the sciences are based on the same type of principles. Uh, it's, they are empirical and they use logic and mathematics sometimes, but uh, when it comes in the end, everything that cannot be tested against experience uh, should, be, uh, uh, should be discarded. Now, that didn't work out very well to combat Nazis. Uh, they didn't care about that, uh, those uh, methodological rules. But what's interesting, though, is that most of these people, uh, they, of course, had to, to run away from Austria and Germany, and they went to the United States and founded an Lisbon philosophy. Uh, that's a simplification, of course, but uh, there is uh, a lot of truth to it. OK, let's fast forward. Am I doing bad on time? Or is it? It's OK, good. Um, anyway, let's fast forward another 100 years, so from 1920s to uh, 2020s, something where we are now. Now, if we had um, a Latin philosophy, Vienna Circle, uh, in the middle of the, uh, the two wars, Cold War, um, today then, uh, we have the internet and post-truth. And this one is a little bit different. So first of all, uh, the first problem or the first strategies were book culture then printing press culture or sort of uh, the daily press, uh, sorry, daily press culture where things were a little bit faster. And now everything is hyper fast. So mm. somebody can go on Facebook or Twitter or uh, no, what is it? X formerly known as Twitter, yeah, uh, or uh, Instagram, whatever, on social media. And uh, anyone in this uh, hyper individualist landscape can have an idea about uh, your truth and your truth and your truth. And you can express it. There is nothing preventing you from expressing it. All right? So, whereas the Enlightenment philosophers, they were, you know, they really had to watch it because if they if they published something that went uh, against the church or the king or, uh, I don't know, the duke or whatever, they, could, they were in really bad trouble. Now, every one of you can just say whatever you want, more or less, basically, on your, uh, on your smartphones. And it just has uh, a global reach. So nothing is preventing you. We don't have really censorship, at least not in, uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, in many other places, yes. But uh, there is nothing preventing you from expressing my truth, right? Um, also, as we know, something that is posted on, on the internet by, by, by means of this logic, well, it becomes popular because it affects emotions. And this is why uh, cute cats and etc. are sort of the most popular uh, expressions of enlightenment in, in, in general culture because they are, most, they are the most liked ones. If somebody says a boring fact about uh, found this interesting scientific article. Nobody hits the like, like button. So, so we have this, uh, uh, this thing going. Anyway, so, but there are some serious consequences as well. I mean, cats are not all, all that serious, even though they're dead cute. They're not dead serious in that sense. But many will have argued that um, the, this is being exploited by political forces. So. Either you say Donald Trump uses lies and, uh, and false uh, false facts. I don't know. Can fact be false? No. And false false ideas, uh, perhaps, uh, puts out there. Uh, Putin, on the other hand, he has all of this fake information coming out as part of his hybrid warfare. So, and then when you know uh, this hits the public sphere, which is now super fast and internet mediates it and effect driven then it's not all that you know uh, uh, we, we, we can clearly see that we have a problem if, if these lies are uh, spread now what would be the self-defense technique then so enlightenment philosophy and uh, all the way up to the uh, uh, Vienna circle and uh, uh, Europe uh, during the wars 
would uh, go back and say, trust the scientific method. Now, the scientific method can mean many different things. It would be one thing for rationalist philosophers, another one for empiricists, etc. But they would all take uh, a moment to step back and say, there are ways of determining if this is true and this is false. Now, this doesn't really work all that way. I mean, so for example, if I, uh, uh, if my truth is that you know, everybody says that smoking causes cancer, uh, but in my world, my grandmother, she has smoked uh, three packs of cigarettes, and she's eighty years old. She did that for her whole life, and she's still alive. You know, from my perspective, my truth about smoking seems to me that shouldn't be a big problem. So I go out and I say that there is science has for at least three decades put out all of these studies that show uh, uh, um, that smoking actually causes cancer. It's so secure, this, this result, this uh, outcome of this research is so certain that we can even print its own cigarette packs. Uh, but in my world, my truth, well, I, in, not, not in my world, because I have this anecdote about my grandmother. Now, how can you tell them, uh, for example, uh, 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 give them say, well, uh, you just made uh, uh, um, a strange connection between one empirical event and another empirical event. That would be sort of Hume trying to, to argue against me. Or um, uh, perhaps uh, um, somebody, um, I, I don't know, uh, somebody would ask me, where does your empirical data come from? What, what are the studies based on, etc.? cetera? Uh, and there are none. Uh, because in my truth, uh, all that matters is my own experience. Right? I think, and I'm going to end now, and my suggestion here is, is, is preliminary, but it's based more on uh, what we call uh, all of these ideas were classical theory of science. Now, my argument here is based more on uh, what we call modern theory of science. And I think that if we are going to sort of pierce through this hyper-individualist post-truth bubble, we have to go back to the 17th century uh, when the scientific method was sort of establishing its modern form. What is the modern form? The modern form is, it's experimental, so we do conduct experiments uh, in order to test out things. Uh, we, it's also a social enterprise. This is where when peer review was invented. So uh, people would come and be witnesses uh, for the experiment. And people who witnessed an experiment could then make their own judgment about is this correctly done or not correctly done. And I think that science has an, uh, um, uh, an amazing opportunity now, using the same internet and, and the mass communication ultra-fast medium, and say, all right, so you don't believe that uh, um, smoking causes cancer. Let me show you how these studies were made. Let's open up the laboratory, uh, give you the data, give you the results, uh, make sort of a uh, scientific practice accessible to people. Maybe then, they can go outside uh, their post-truth bubbles and disconnect from ex Mondrian's Twitter or whatever. <laughs> okay, thank you.
So, um, I'm going to uh, kind of lecture a little bit too at the beginning to walk us through um, a central topic or subject of debate in um, contemporary analytic metaphysics. One that even professional philosophers are often tempted to say, why does that why does that debate matter at all? Like even if we're just doing philosophy and philosophical departments and so forth, that debate doesn't seem to make any difference to much of anything. Um, and then I'm gonna use an example to try to argue, well, actually that debate isolated in its most kind of uh, ivory tower abstract sense um, might matter to us at least psychologically or sentimentally in, a, in an immediately recognizable way. So that's where we're headed. I don't know if you'll be convinced, but we'll see. Um, so this debate, this problem goes back uh, in Western philosophy at least to Plato under the heading the problem of um, the one over the many. So the many here are just objects or things, and the one is what they seem to have in common. So the, the little illustration here, which by the way was AI generated, <laughs> it was so the, what I put in I know, what I put in was uh, two black teacups and it kept making parts of them not black but this is the best I could do but so think about two black teacups if the illustration helps then good um, clearly there are two objects there one cup on the excuse me, the, 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 the left and one cup on the right um, but they're the same exact shade of black right so there's some sense of sameness where while there are two, and there could be many more, there could be you know, 50 teacups or whatever, there are two, there's some sense in which they're literally the same. Um, we're so used to talking about traits and characteristics and properties that might not seem that puzzling, but the, the next step in the thought is, well, the way in which they're the same is this, this kind of thing, a feature or a property or a trait. There's one of those, in this case, blackness, even though there are two or more things that have this one feature. Um, now, the debate that I want to look at that's kind of bullet pointed here is how are we to clearly think about that sort of common observation, that there are resemblances, there are some kind of thing in the most general sense that multiple things have in common. The reason it's puzzling is because the very simple fact that two does not equal one. Um, I, I used to do this thing with, with my daughter that I think is very common, where she would keep asking the iterations of the why question to me. Why, did, you know, why don't you let me do this? And I'd explain, but why does that matter? Why does that? Usually, maybe because I'm a philosopher, it would bottom out in me saying, well, because one does not equal zero, or because two does not equal one. Like that's maybe that's a fact about her and about me, but that's like where those conversations would get. But at any rate, it's hard to say more than that if there are two teacups, they are not literally numerically the same, but something here is, in this case, the color feature, blackness, okay. So how are we to account for that? How does that work? How can there be some one something or other somehow stretching across these two different things? Well, here's one way it could go. It could be that these things, properties, or this thing, blackness, just isn't in space at all. The teacups are, but properties, blackness in this case, is transcendent as it's sometimes put. And this was in fact Plato's view of this feature. Um, okay, maybe that's how it works. There's some connection between this platonic realm that isn't spatial at all to things that are in space, in this case a pair of teacups, and somehow the lack of spatial features play an explanatory role in these things resembling. Interesting, maybe that works. Um, here's a very different take on it, which is sort of loosely goes back to Aristotle. Um, is to say it, there is this thing, in this case blackness, um, but it's not outside of space at all. It's just blackness is where the black things are. So there's blackness in the, the teacup on the, the left, and there's blackness in the teacup on the right, and there's blackness in the night sky, and so on. Blackness is just that kind of thing. But look, that's a really weird thing. <laughs> that's a thing such that it's at distances from itself. So there's blackness in this teacup and blackness in this teacup, but maybe not here. But there's just this one thing that can do that somehow. Here's the way that's sometimes put. It's wholly, with a W, wholly multiply located. The whole thing is where this teacup is, but the whole very same thing is where this teacup is and where some 
black pair of shoes are over there in a different city and so on. Maybe, maybe that's what this kind of thing, a property or a feature or a characteristic is. Um, that's, that's called the imminent theory, the imminent universal theory. Or you could be a different kind of theorist. You could say, I, I kind of like that last one where the properties are in space with us, but I didn't like that weird last bit, the wholly multiply located mm -hmm. bit. I think that the blackness, whatever it is, is in the teacups, but it's, it works sort of this way. There's the blackness of this teacup that's just there. And then there's, if you will, the blackness of this teacup that's just there. And the two blacknesses aren't literally numerically the same. When we talk about a characteristic or a feature or a property blackness, we mean something like the collection of the different instances of blackness. And that's it. There's nothing more to it than that. Uh, by the way, I kind of like that view, so I'm portraying it as though it makes the most common sense. But, but you, you may not, you may disagree. I mean, this is, uh, so it starts at least with Plato, but this is still live debate um, among folks like me. Which, which of these is the most plausible, interesting theory? I tend to think it's that one, but, but maybe that's not right. Or you could be what's called a nominalist. You could think, sure, we talk in name about these predicates like black or virtuous or whatever to name all these features. Um, but we made a mistake back when we were doing the one over many. We thought there is this entity, this thing, blackness. But that, that's just more than we need to be committed to. There are teacups, there are night skies, there are cats, and so on. There are black objects, but there's no additional thing, blackness. Maybe you like that view more from the perspective of common sense. Um, that view is called nominalism. So for our purposes, I'm going to just sidestep that, the first view, the transcendent property view, and the last view, the nominalist view. Not because they're no good and there aren't interesting arguments, but I'm going to just kind of weed them out. Uh, you might not like the first one just to motivate weeding it out, because the being outside of space aspect of it is just kind of weird. Properties seem to get us to do things all the time, right? I, I eat the sandwich because of its uh, gustatory properties and things like that. Um, it's really weird how that could work, given that the sandwich is there and tasting like such and such is outside space entirely. Mm -hmm. Um, also, nominalism's counterintuitive in certain ways um, for, for similar reasons. It seems like properties are maybe more fundamental than objects, and that objects do the things they do because they have properties. If you think there are no properties at all, you can't tell any sort of story like that. So you need not be convinced by those two counter motivations, but let's focus on the, the putting properties really in space views, the imminent view that has this whole multiple location aspect to it, and the trope view that says, yes, there are properties, they are in space, but they don't do that, that whole multiple location. Okay, we're looking at those two, um, those two theories. Now, what's really at stake between them? It's whether we think there are some kind of entities or other that can do that fancy, weird, whole, multiply locating. And I, I want to suggest before I get to why I think this attaches to something we might actually care about psychologically, I want to suggest that it's independently intellectually interesting as a question whether there is anything like that. Because that is a big, important difference. I mean, just think from your own first-person perspective. If you could be multiply located where all of you is here, like all of you is in Australia right now, so that makes a pretty big difference, like whether, whether you could do that or not. Okay. So, I, I mean, again, because I'm kind of interested in this stuff, I actually think an argument could be made just right there that it's not a nothing debate, that there actually is something really interesting to the debate. Um, but it, it's not, so when we're talking about something like the color of teacups, it doesn't make a clear practical difference to us whether the imminent theory or the trope theory is true. It's not going to change any of our experiences. I don't know which one's true. Um, and, and it relates in some ways to, to the concern of the folks in the Vienna Circle, right? You're certainly not going to go into a lab and, like, solve this issue. I don't, I don't think it's possible to do that. It's difficult to say what would decide the debate between. Um, but what I want to briefly argue is, despite having those features, it's really hard to tell which one's true. It might not even be possible to tell. Um, and it doesn't make a clear difference to our uh, ordinary experience. I think, actually, it does matter in a way that uh, we might find interesting. So here's an example. Uh, let's see, where are we on the handout? We're on the back side now, I think. Um, so suppose 
you go to a flea market and you buy a teacup. It's a fancy old looking teacup or whatever, you like it. You start using it regularly with your morning coffee or tea. You're enjoying having it. Um, consider this technical notion. I'll call it your least desirable person. So take a moment, it's kind of a dark counterexample, but take a, or a, a thought experiment, but take a moment and think to yourself, just what person do you like the least of all time? <laughs> I could give some suggestions, but I don't want to. I don't know. <laughs> um, think whoever it is. It might be a despotic historical figure. It might just be someone that is gross to you and you don't like them. <laughs> have, have that person in mind. Okay, so you've, you've got that person in mind. You've bought a, a teacup at a flea market that you're enjoying and you use regularly. Now consider two further uh, details about how the example could go. In case one, you find out that your least desirable person owns or owned a teacup just like this one that you bought. That might not make a huge difference to you, but at least for me, I'd kind of be like, oh, that kind of, kind of sucks. Like, I, 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 I liked this a lot, but now I found out like so-and-so. Like, okay, but now in case two, you find out your least desirable person used to own that very teacup that you bought and used to drink from it and so on. Do you feel the difference between those two cases? I, I do, and some people might not, but okay. Um, I, I think there is an interesting difference between those two cases. So the difference is, in the first case, uh, you found out that there's this qualitative identity between the teacup that touches your lips in the morning and one that touched the lips of your least desirable person. In the second case, it's numerical identity that you now discover. The same thing touching your lips touched the lips of your least desirable person. And that's the part that, at least for me, where I'd be like, oh, that's not just a little bit imperfect. It's kind of unsettling and icky in some way. Okay. Okay. Now, set aside teacups made of some material, porcelain, or whatever it is. Think, think about electrons and properties of electrons. So uh, one unit of negative charge in each electron or something like that. Now think about where electrons are. They're all over the place. I'm not a chemist, but they're all over the place, right? <laughs> um, there are a bunch touching my lips right now. And you could get kind of cute and think about a teacup-shaped cloud of electrons right here touching my lips right now. <laughs> So there's unit negative charge, teacup shaped, <laughs> touching my lips right now. Whoever my least desirable person is, there are a bunch of instances of time where there's unit negative charge touching his lips. Make it teacup shaped if you want to. Uh, if the imminent theory of properties is correct, then the property unit negative charge is the very same thing all over my lips right now. That's all over his lips right now. Actually, he's deceased, but my, my <laughs> lips are over. But that, that doesn't matter. <laughs> um, plenty of times in the past. That matters to me in the same way that the teacup identity uh, question matters to me. I, I guess I'd kind of like it to be true if it was just that there are instances of unit negative charge that are exactly similar to the instances of unit negative charge touching his lips, but aren't literally the same thing. For just the same reason I'd prefer case one to case two if we're talking about a porcelain teacup or a, a tin cup or whatever it may be. But look, that, that is just the imminent universal trope debate. Are properties literally wholly multiply located where it's the very same thing in different places at different times, or is it a different numerically different thing that's the unit negative charge going on over here from the unit negative charge going on over there. If the trope theory is true, I can kind of not worry so much about uh, what's touching my lips, and we'll leave it at lips. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's the idea. Uh, if case one and case two matter to you, it's not going to change your life, but if that matters to you psychologically or even sentimentally or at some comfort level, then this quite obscure-seeming abstract debate in contemporary analytic metaphysics actually directly bears on something that psychologically and sentimentally affects you in just the same way. 
Um, and there's nothing special really about unit negative charge. There's all kinds of properties, right? Whoever your least desirable person is, they're also, by, by sort of stipulation, human. So you, there's your humanity that's here. There's his or her humanity that's there. That makes a difference, whether it's literally the very same thing going on here that's going on there. Okay, um, two quick points of, I, I know, uh, I, actually I don't know how I'm doing on time, but in general we're uh, probably getting ready to wrap up. Two quick points, there are other debates in analytic metaphysics that you could run the same way of thinking for having to do with what it is for an object to be the same object over time. Because a parallel debate takes place where some philosophers think it's to have different parts at different times, and other philosophers think, no, it's to be the very same thing all through time. So you could imagine uh, a different example about the, the teacup, staying in a hotel room or something in a very historic room and bed that your least desirable person once stayed in, or just it's uh, um, not that literally the same thing was stayed in by your least desirable person, but it's just a distant it's called temporal part of that bed in that hotel room. It's an obscure distinction if you're not steeped in studying it professionally, but it's just like the teacup case over time. Um, ending on a happy note, you could run the same thing without going with your least desirable person, but maybe your most desirable one. You love Elvis or something. That could sound a little happier. Like, oh, my lips are touching what Elvis's lips are touching. <laughs> that, then it maybe works for the end of the universe. <laughs> som är sugna på att fortsätta kvällen så tänker jag att vi går bort till folk. Och för er som inte är bekant med vart folk ligger så är det liksom runt eh, Folkets hus, draken här, bort mot eh, första långgatan. Det är samma anslutning som till Folkgatan för de som inte vet det ligger. Om det finns plats där. Om det finns plats där. Vi, det är chans att vi får se. Är det så att det är fullt där också? Vi hade tänkt bara på Schnitzelplats som ligger i samma hus här men där var det för fullt. Så vi går till folk. Vi återkommer med flera arrangemang, troligtvis i början av eh, båtaminen. Och är det så att någon av er vill engagera sig i föreningen och vara med och planera och komma med förslag på vad vi kan eh, hitta på oss så får ni hemskt gärna höra av er till oss. Enklast kanske är att höra av sig via föreningens Facebook-sida, annars går det ju såklart också att mejla. Våra mejladresser finns någonstans. Vi har en hemsida, va? Ja. Det ska bli en hemsida. Det ska bli en hemsida. Vi ska ha en hemsida. Där det finnas adekvata kontaktuppgifter. Men tack så hemskt mycket för att ni kom ikväll. Och återigen ett jättestort tack till våra föreläsare. Så en till liten applåd till dem.